listening to, you are absolutely listening to the George Espen Love Show coming to you live from the Funny Farm. Now with no further ado, here comes Georgie! <laughs> oh yeah thank you thank you thank you thank you charlie you never cease to amaze me my friend uh i appreciate charlie so much because he's in here running the soundboard and you know he does the intro and uh, he just does a, a multitude of things around here, <clears throat> and I just I just can't commend him enough. But anyhow, you're listening to the George Espinlove Show, coming to you live from the Funny Farm in a place called Our World, and it's a whole lot safer here than it is in your world. And listen to me. Whether you're down the street, around the corner, somewhere across America, or around this great big world, we're delighted that you took the time to tune in to the show tonight because we have one humdinger of a show. Uh, I don't know how many of you ever heard that word, but we have one humdinger of a show. Our guest is in the seat, ready to go, and we're going to bring him on in just a few minutes. <clears throat> but I want to tell you something. Our goal, number one, is to bring a smile to your face. If it's just a little smile, we want to lift some of the burdens off of you. We want to make you feel a little free, a little happy, even if it's for a few moments. And if we can make you laugh, we'll really be happy. Our other goal is just to make you as goofy as the rest of us. <laughs> And if we can do one of two things, we'll be happy. If we can do both of those things, oh, we'll be delighted beyond words. We've got a lot of things going on uh, pertaining to the George Espinlob show. And later on tonight, I will share with you some of the things. I mean, this thing is banging, and it is moving. I feel like... I feel like uh, and I'll play it for you again some night. When Charlie jumped on the horse and the horse ran away with him, I feel like that right about now because this thing is moving, and all I can do is just get a hold of something and hang on. And here's what I want you to do. Miss Ernestine's already out on the dance floor. They're doing their stretch outs, you know, so you don't pull no muscles. But this is what I want to do. What, what I want you to do, get it right, Espelob. Get it right. Okay, okay, I got it. Loosen up. It's Monday night. The chat room is open. Come on in. There's no chairs in there because we dance a lot. And it wouldn't do you no good to sit down tonight anyhow because what Dr. Hall has to say would put you right on the edge of your seat and you'd end up standing up anyhow. So get loose, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Say goodbye, I love you, that's for sure. I left my pride, Lord, standing my way. Gonna miss my baby girl named Linda Kay. I'm on that freight train, rumbling out Georgia. See my tail light, looking down the track, rolling up out for sweet Carolina. You know, my baby. My baby wants Rolling me back. Rolling up out for sweet Carolina. Lord. You know my baby, 
my baby wants me back. That, ladies and gentlemen, was my good friend Remus Tucker out of Denver, Colorado. Uh, and we'll be announcing some good, good things that's taking place later on. But tonight's show is sponsored by Unicorn Chasing with Maxine and Walter. That's right, Unicorn Chasing with Maxine and Walter. Look them up on Facebook. They have live ring bomb parties. Ever been to one? What is a ring bomb party? Here's what you do. Go to Facebook, type in up there in that little search thingy, Unicorn Chasin, C-H-A-S-I-N, Unicorn Chasin with Maxine and Walter. That's Unicorn Chasin with Maxine and Walter. Look them up. They go live two, three, four times a week, and they have what's called a ring bomb party. You'll find out what it's all about. And they'll be happy that you came, and I know by the time you leave, you yourself will be happy that you went. Sounds like a big rumbling sound under my foot. But anyhow, <laughs> look them up. Unicorn Chasing with Maxine and Walter. C-H-A-S-I-N. All right. With no further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we have a man here with the most inspiring story, and I believe that you will be sitting on the edge of your chair, if you have a chair. We have no chairs here. Well, we stand up because we dance around a lot. But a man has the most inspiring story, and it will not only touch your heart. I believe that there's men and women, boys and girls out there that's going to listen to this thing not only tonight, but they're going to go back and listen to it. People are going to get touched by it, and it's going to help. And if it helps one individual, then it's worth it all. We have with us Dr. Christopher Hall. And Dr. Hall, 
Welcome to the George Espinlob Show. Hey, thank you, George. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be on your show. You have the most inspiring story. And, my, there's so much to it. And such a contrast from the beginning to now. But let's let's go back in the beginning. Now, you've written a book, and it's entitled The Ward of the Court. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And we can, we can find this book where? On Amazon. Um, if you go to Amazon, uh, the actual site there, and just type in Ward of the Court, uh, it will come right up. When did you write this book? This book is a year old, but it actually began probably about 10 years ago when I started writing it, but uh, just just been out published now a year. You grew up, or you were born back in, what, 1966, is that what you told me? Yes, sir. Give us a little insight of your very early life. Sure, sure, no problem at all. I was actually born in uh, the, what are called the Nickerson Gardens, and that's in Watts, California. And um, I lived there up until probably, probably the age of four. Um, I had other siblings, and you know they lived there uh, most of their life. But at the age of four, uh, myself and my siblings were found a home, uh, were found at home rather, alone. Uh, our mother was gone. And, uh, and so social services was called in to, uh, to take care of us. You were four. Were, were you the youngest yes, or somewhere in between? I was the youngest. And so they came and they removed you from the home. When, when That's they, correct. When they took you from the home, did they take all of you together and, and place you together? Or were you separated? Well, you know, that would be the ideal thing. That's what you would think. But no, typically, and in, 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 in particularly in Los Angeles County, uh, families, when they're put in foster care, are separated. So we were all put into different kind of uh, foster homes at that point. And here's what I would like for you to do, Dr. Hall. You were taken from the home, separated from your siblings, and placed in a foster home. Tell us a little bit about the journey from foster home to foster home and what transpired in each one of them. Sure, no problem. So, you know, the first foster home was when I was four years old, and I think uh, it was Miss Hankins. And and so kind of what happens there is you're, you're – I was barefoot. It was raining. Um Ms. Hankins uh, took me in. Um, I very vividly remember asking her, can I call you mom? And she said yes. But even at four years old and as you get older, it's a, it's a very confusing uh, situation. You're there. You have these foster parents. You may know that you're, you have your real parents that are living, but you don't know where they are. And you're not sure why you're placed um, in kind of a foster care. So it's kind of a cute, confusing uh, to a young person. So, so go, go ahead. Yes, sir. So you want me to continue with the journey? I can tell yeah, you. Yeah. Um, yes, please. Okay, please. so I, I think with Miss Miss Hankins, I was there probably, I was there two years. And then there was, uh, I think, another foster home. And you know, at this point, I can remember there was a succession of foster homes, and at some point, when I was 11 years old, I ended up in in juvenile hall. And it's not because I don't think I was intrinsically bad as a kid. I think that what happens is, and particularly in LA County, where you have a large number of foster children, is you end up in a situation when you're in the foster homes, 
And when you're in boys' homes where you're around um, gang activity and you're around uh, bad influences. Even though you were four years old, and, and, this, and I've been thinking about this, you were taken from the home when you were four. And so each year you find yourself maybe in the same place and then all of a sudden you're someplace else and, and you're just bounced around like a, a, like a ball on a pinball machine. Tell me the emotions that that went through you. You must you must have went through all different kind of emotions when all this was taking place, right? Most definitely, and the major emotion is is, is sadness, <clears throat> sadness, and um, because up until recently, when foster kids were moved, uh, particularly in Los Angeles County. There was no, they did not have to, they did not have to give them like a 10 day warning or a five day warning. It would be an order from the court. And that day they could come at 10 at night when you sleep and move you to another, another placement. And so I think that's just recently changed to where they have to actually give um, a certain notice to the, the children. So there's, there was an emptiness, uh, I imagine there was the big question, why? <laughs> why why is this happening to me? Did you ask yourself that? Every day. You ask yourself, <clears throat> why am I, uh, where's my family? Where's my mom and dad? Um, yes, why did this actually happen uh, to myself, my family? You ask yourself that a whole lot. And so... There's the feeling of emptiness, there's sadness, then there's the feeling of, hey, maybe my family didn't want me. There's the feeling of rejection. And so you go through you go through all that kind of feeling, where do I belong? Just seems like you never fit. Well, you move around, and particularly in my situation, I moved around every two, about every two to three years. I'm going to three different high schools. And so you get used to it. You get used to it. Um, just kind of moving. And when you were at these foster homes, <clears throat> uh, were you were you abused at any one any of them? Mentally abused or physically abused, or were they pretty squared away places? I would just say some were better than others, um, particularly when you got to the boys' homes. And I, I was probably in at least three or four different boys' homes uh, between, wow, maybe 11 years old and when I was 17. But sometimes, you know, you have people there who are just there for a paycheck, and so they really don't care about the, the kids. And so, but um, I would say no, I, I didn't um, receive any abuse. You became quite an escape artist, uh, and I'm, I'm just using that term lightly. But but you ran away quite a bit in each one of the foster homes. Certainly, and I and I think what you're saying, escape car artist, is correct because it would occur out the window in the middle of the night <laughs> in the grocery store, and you disappear. And so, again, those were feelings of um, rebellion. Um, you're running away. You're not really sure where you're going. Uh, it's again, it's it's the whole confusion. Of, of the uh, situation. Did you ever, how can I put this? Did, did you ever, was there a time in your life, uh, and this is going to sound strange, but was there a time in your life that you didn't feel loved? That's a very, very good question. Very good question. And I would say this, I had an older sister who uh, at some point, you know, she would, she would come around and see myself and my, my other sister, she's about two years older than me. So she was six at the time she went to, to foster care. And so she would come by and see us on the holidays. 
and, and let us know that that you have family, uh, you have people that care for you, and so that certainly helped. Um, but yeah, I mean there there are those there are those times in in, in foster home and particularly juvenile hall where you you certainly don't feel loved. So, I guess Dr. Hall, what what I'm what I'm asking is, when we don't feel love or we don't feel loved, then we're going to feel other things. Is that correct? That's definitely correct. And when when you went from foster home to foster home and then into juvenile, how many juvenile homes was you in? Well, the foster homes, we can start there, probably – at least three or four, and then there were boys' homes that were at least three or four, and then I was in every juvenile hall in L.A. County, Orange County, Riverside, Torrance, um, and so you're really never anywhere for more than two years, one or two years. I went to, and going to actually three different high schools because of it. And you did that all the way, I mean, you went to elementary school, and you went to middle school, and you went to high school. How, how many schools did you go to? Again, that that number is um, that number is it, it's hard to say. But what what's to note is that a lot of kids who are in um, boys' homes and uh, are not able to go actually to public school um, sometimes because they have um, anger issues. Um, again, feelings of frustration, feelings of loneliness. And so uh, typically what will happen is they'll put you in the uh, schools in the facility, uh, like in a, a boy's home. They'll put you in the on-campus schools, and at some point they'll see, hey, maybe he needs to go to public school. And so that happened to me uh, throughout my, my childhood. I was able to go to public school. This, this whole ordeal uh... – being taken out of the home, foster schools, uh, youth centers, and then juvenile hall, and there was something. When when you got to high school, did things begin to click in your head that maybe I better get this thing corrected or I better get myself right? You're exactly right, and it was it was right. I think when I was in ninth grade, you know, and I would say this, if you would look at my grades from ninth grade or even 10th grade, you would never predict that one day I would be, would uh, become a doctor. Um, and some of that again was the situation, just uh, the confusion, the multiple transfers. Uh, you just don't really focus on school at that young age, but I think I probably was about 14 when I realized, look, I'm becoming a man. And I knew at age 18 that the state of California would say, Hey, you're done and you've got to go out and, and fend for yourself. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, children uh, in those, in the foster homes and boys homes, sometimes they just go to the street. Okay. Um, some can go to the military uh, right from there. And so I had to come up with a plan. And your plan was? And, well, this is the thing. If you, uh, actually, George, um, in the book, actually in the book, there's a part um, where I met, this, I met this boy's home. It's called um, Children's Baptist Home. And I'm talking to a social worker, and I don't remember her name exactly, but I, remember, I think her name was Vimla Singh. And so she brought me in her office one day. I'd been having, you know, I'd been a problem kid, getting in fights, um, uh, ditching classes. And she brought me in her office one day and she said, you know, she said, with your grades, she said, you will not be able to get into one state university in the state of California. And she said, I know you're smarter than the way you're portraying yourself. And she goes, I don't know why you're doing that. But she goes, I know you can do better. And that's about the time it hit me. So was it an instant turnaround? Or did it take a while? 
Well, what I did was, and I think this was, like I said, I'm, I'm thinking ninth grade. I actually went into my room and said, look, let me read the books. Let me uh, come up with a system of, of, of memorizing this data and see if it works. And it did. My grades improved steadily. Uh, but that was just for one year for ninth grade. Tenth grade is a whole other story. You go to high school, you start, uh, you know, um, getting around an older crowd. And then again, I was back at tenth grade with a um, similar situation. In fact, I would tell you this, and it's funny to me today. There's a class that was called survival in tenth grade, and I think the class dealt with maybe learning how to fill out tax forms and how to survive in society. Well, that class survival, I received an F in, and that was in tenth grade. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I want young people to see who are in similar situations and who, and this is what the book is about, who believe that their situation is hopeless, that look at this guy, Christopher Hall. If he can do it, I can do it. There's countless hundreds of thousands possibly several million young people across this country. Uh, we, we don't have a large community here. Uh, we have a, a town. We live in a town, and there's other towns around us. But right here in our area, you can see kids that are uh, despondent, you can see where some of them, even at a young age, their spirit's been broken. They have that, that look on their face like this <laughs> this is what it's going to be. This, this is where I'm at. And there's no use of trying. Uh, and we need to reach these kids somehow, some way, correct? Definitely. We definitely, we definitely do because um, pretty much that's the future. You know, our, our children are the future, and you know that's what I'm. I'm using myself as an example of a guy who comes from nowhere. He's from the projects. Um, if you read the book, you know his dad went to prison. You know, uh, for for manslaughter, for murder. Uh, his brother, uh, my brother, has a, a chapter in the book. It's called Wayne's Words. Well, he grew up the same situation I did, but you know, and if you read the book, you'll see that Wayne is serving 1,300 years in federal prison. Yes. He writes a, a nice chapter. He says, actually, he takes responsibility. He says, look, you guys may think this is bad, but he says, I deserve to be here, and he counts out all the bad things he did. He's a man. He takes responsibility. And all through that chapter, or all through the letter that he wrote to you, he keeps reminding young people, uh, you don't want to be here. You don't want to come here. Uh, this is not a nice place. Get an education. Uh, get a hold of yourself. Uh, I was quite impressed when I read the letter that he wrote. Uh, but you're absolutely right. He... He isn't blaming someone else. He takes the blame, uh, and he talks about life in prison. So there's there's quite a contrast. Uh, did did he? And I, and I know both of your lives was rough from the beginning, but did he have the same opportunities that that you had? He certainly did. And in fact, he told me one, one day, he said, you know what, Chris? He said, all those little books and things that you bring home and read, he said, you know what? If I want to do that, I could, but I don't want to. Wayne was a person who was, I would describe him as a ladies' man. Uh, he was very popular with the ladies. Uh, he was uh, very much into dressing and how he looked with clothes. Um, 
and and so he ended up um, in lots of trouble. I mean, he ended up in um, in drugs and crime, um, and and so now, I mean, he's he's a, he's a six time felon, and he's in in prison for life. And so that this is the the contrast that the book is trying to provide again to young people. Both of these guys grew up the same way. They're brothers. One took this path because of certain steps that he made, and the other one took this path because of certain steps that he made. Which path do you want to take? And so that that's kind of what the book is about. And and again, it's the whole idea of having hope, um, believing in ourselves and believing that there is a God that is directing our path because without that God, where would I be today? When uh, I I read in the book, you were, uh, I can't remember exactly where you were, but I remember the part where you received the letter and it said, congratulations, you've been accepted into a school. Uh, what was that? Yes, sir. So I went to three different high schools. The last one I went to was Manual Arts High School. And it's in the city. It's in the inner city of Los Angeles. It's a pretty rough high school. Uh, but I was in a boys' home at that time until I was about um, about eight, seventeen. And um, and so I had started applying to colleges, and I knew my grades weren't that great. Okay, like I said. Ninth grade, tenth grade, just you would never predict, uh, you know, what the book talks about. But um, anyway, I, I did receive a letter from uh, the California State University at Chico. And that letter to me was, was a life saver because I knew that if I could get myself to college, I determined it at, you know, like I said, ninth and tenth grade, I was going to turn myself around. Um, I didn't want to go to path where, you know, Wayne was my older brother. I saw kind of saw the path that he had went. I had an older sister. I kind of saw her path that where she went. Uh, she never went to college. She didn't graduate from high school. In fact, she was thrown out of every school in the Los Angeles Unified School District. So that letter to me meant hope. And again, that, that's the theme of this book is that we are in uh, a country although we may start at different points in life, um, that we're in a country where we have opportunity and where we can take care of one another and where there is hope and where our path actually is being followed by God. When, when you went to school, <clears throat> uh, when, when you was accepted into school, what did you major in? Uh, yes, sir. Um, in undergraduate, I, I majored in chemistry. And then you 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 got your bachelor's degree, right, from that college? Yes, sir. And you went to dental school? That's right. And so if you read through the book, it'll talk about – um, and it's, it, it's very detailed. It tells you everything in the book. I list grades, test scores, because I want people to see that, again, a person from this background who was not a very good student uh, at, early on, maybe in ninth grade or 10th grade, 10th grade, can actually do better later on and can actually score um, high on standardized test scores. And so that's what's listed in there. But um, – I initially, um, I, I graduated from uh, the California State University at Chico. Uh, this was in 1988. I started there in 84. And then from there, I went to the Northwestern University Dental School, uh, which is in Chicago. There is, <clears throat> there's a lady in the chat room that said, hats off to Chris for not allowing your childhood keeping you from becoming a success. Uh and that lady wanted me to tell you that. So, so you, thank you. So you went to dental school. Uh, yes, sir. Did you complete dental school? 
Well, you know, I did not. I went to dental school actually for three years, and and uh, in dental school is four years. And so the question is, how did I end up in dental school? Yes. And so if you actually read through the book, it talks about, uh, you know, my aspirations. I wanted to become a doctor. It talks about myself applying to dental school and medical school. And it, it, it talks about my test scores for, you know, on the dental admissions test. And it talks about my grades. And so in college um, at California State University of Chico, I studied chemistry. And I was, I was, I would say a pretty good student. I made an A and a B in almost every class I took. Um, but I think my GPA was probably just maybe a, a little bit above the B range. And so I said, look, I don't know if this is going to be competitive enough for medical school. Um, I'm going to apply to both of them. Well, it turns out that I actually did get admitted to the Howard University Medical School. And I was put on the option list back in 19... Let me see. No, that was 1989. Yeah, on the uh, a, a, an option list at another medical school, and I was admitted into a number a number of dental schools. And so, um, I ended up going to dental school um, at Northwestern. Ladies and gentlemen, if you just stumbled in, fell in, pushed in, or you intentionally came in to the show tonight, you, we have Dr. Chris Hall with us as our guest. Uh, an inspirational story of his life, what it was, and where he's at today. Tremendous. And his book, Ward of the Court, you can get it at Amazon. Is it in Kindle form, did you say, Chris? It, it, yes, sir. It's also in Kindle form. Just go to Amazon and, and type in that little search thingy, uh, Ward of the Court, and you can get a copy of Chris's book, uh, and it'll be quite thorough, and it'll be fun, and I, I'll tell you, it'll be a good read. I don't think you'll be able to put it down once, once you start. So you went to dental school, uh, and then I guess after that you had to go to medical school, right? I guess so. <laughs> so Yeah, uh, I Yes, sir, I'm listening. No, go ahead. So so kind of so what happened there? So this is kind of what happened. So I went to dental school and you know, I was a chemistry major. And so you don't take a whole lot of biology, you know, in chemistry. And so I went to dental school and so there's just there's like massive loads of, of biology classes you have to take. So this is really my first time learning things like physiology, um, neuroscience, histology. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, I really would like to learn more about the whole body. Certainly, you know, the oral cavity and the head is great. Um, and so at some point, I actually went three years. I went three years. I took the, uh, the, the boards in dental school. And at some point I said, you know, I think I'm going to, I think I, I'm going to actually quit and go to medical school. And it's really not that easy. You can't just quit dental school and go to medical school. They don't. Just, they don't let you do that. You can't just, there's no transferring. It's kind of starting from scratch. So what happened? Well, I ended up quitting dental school. And so I went to apply to medical school and they said, you know, all those biology courses you took in dental school, they don't count. <laughs> you have to go back and take undergraduate classes. And so I went back and took some undergraduate classes and, um, you know, the process really is about a year or two. And so within that time period, I ended up going to graduate school. I ended up going and, and earning actually a master's in physical chemistry. Wow. So once you graduated from school, until you got all this stuff together, before you went into the actual medical school, how many years was that from you know, when you first went to college until you got all your stuff together to go into medical school. Exactly. Well, you know, typically it should probably be four years, okay? You should probably do four years of college and then go straight to medical school. My path was a little different because I went to dental school for three years, decided at some point I didn't want to do it, 
and then ended up going to graduate school. And that came about because I was actually taking uh, one of those prerequisite classes for medical school, but I was trying to find a job. And so uh, one, of the, one of the young ladies in the class said, hey, I know someone you can go work for at this university uh, since you have a chemistry degree. Well, when I went up there, he started talking me into the program uh, to come study there. And, and so that's how that came about. And eventually you got into the medical school, uh, and that that took a while to complete that, right? What do you do? You go to medical school, and then you got to do a uh, internship and all those good things. Is that how it works, Chris? It, exactly. So you're exactly right, George. So so typ- the typical pattern is you do the four years of college, and then after that you would go to medical school. That would be four years. And then after that, you do a one year of an internship. And then any years after that would be considered a residency. And so, you know, in my case, since I went to college four years, I went to dental school for three years. And so that's seven. And then I went to graduate school for two more years. That'd be nine. And then I was in medical school for four years. But I would say this. All of that helped me in the end. A lot of the classes in dental school are very similar to the ones in medical school. And so I was able to excel in medical school, able to uh, end up on the dean's list um, uh, because of um, of all that training. So, Now, ladies and gentlemen, wrap your head around this from the worst housing project in L.A. to a life of accomplishment. What a journey. What a journey. What an inspiration to old and young alike out there, Chris. I mean, it inspires me and it inspires uh, it, it inspires all of us and it shows us that if you set your mind to it, if you put your shoulder to the wheel, you can accomplish this. So from the worst housing project to a life of accomplishment, uh, although it was a, a long, rough journey, uh, it finds you as a medical doctor, <clears throat> and you're at a hospital in Mississippi. Is that correct? That's right. Right now I'm working at uh, a hospital called uh, Northwest Mississippi Medical Center. Uh, Great staff, ER staff there. We have a wonderful director, Dr. Ozawa. uh, And Naomi's uh, also ER director there. Um, It's in the Delta. It's in Mississippi, okay? Um, It's an area where there are lots of, lots of, you know, poor and underserved people who who need a lot of help. And so the whole theme is that God has placed his hand on me, took me from a very humble, humble situation to uh, some of the best schools in the country to, if you read the book, you'll see that I served in the military as a captain and as a doctor uh, and earned a a scholarship uh, from the army to attend medical school. Um, and, And then all of that, service to our country, okay, which, 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 George, I want to say to you, your many, many years in the, as a Marine and serving in Vietnam, um, I appreciate your service, sir, to the country. Thank you. But what that says is that God can take his hand of somebody from a very humble background, put them in a situation where they could save lives And literally, I'd say over the last 18 years or so, 19 years, I can't count the number of lives that God has helped me save. Um, And so it's very humbling. Even today, it's just I'm sitting there thinking, wow, I'm I'm, I'm in in the middle of doing this. This is this is this is incredible. And so I I believe um, that we have opportunity in this country. I believe that um, that God is. Is directing our path. So it goes to show each and every one of us uh, 
we can do one of two things. We can either go for it <laughs> or we can just sit down. Uh, I guess that makes it pretty plain, doesn't it? Sounds like it. Another lady said uh, in the chat room, just proves that we are nothing without God. That says it all. Very true. That certainly. When you were in the service, when you were in the Army, uh, you, uh, of course, you come out, you was able to use your GI Bill, right? Okay, so how that works is you pretty much, um, so far as um, I was a doctor before I went into the military, or rather, I'm sorry, I was a medical student before I uh, went to the military because I was like a second year in medical school uh, when I was commissioned as a, a first lieutenant. And so how that works is you can apply for uh, the scholarships from the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, um, you know, to, to help uh, you um, pay for medical school. And so I went to a private medical school, and so it was very expensive. And, and, and so um, if you read in the book, it'll talk about, um, opportunities in the military back in high school, but you'll see later on at some point those opportunities come available to me, become available to myself uh, in medical school, and so it was great. It was great um, being it was great being a doctor in the military, being a captain, um, taking care of our troops, and it's a great way. It was a great way to serve our, to serve the country. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got. That's bad English. You have, or you've got to go to Amazon and look for Chris's book, Ward of the Court by Christopher Hall. Ward of the Court. Now, it's it's in hardback uh, plus Kindle. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Make sure that you go to Amazon. Amazon.com. Everybody knows Amazon. <clears throat> Ward of the Court. And the author is Christopher Hall. So do yourself a favor. Get it. Sit down. Uh, get it in you. And I know it will inspire you. And then hand it off to somebody else and let it inspire them too. Dr. Hall. I am so delighted that you were able to take the time out of your busy, busy schedule and spend time with us tonight to share portions of your story. My hat is off to you, sir. I salute your service. I salute the fact that you went from uh, the worst and you accomplished something great and you're ministering to people through medicine, uh, and I'm sure by other means also. I salute you. I thank you. And please, as your journey continues, somewhere down the road, we would want you to come back and continue to share what's going on with your life. Would you do that for us? Yes, sir. Let me say this, George. And I, I would just say this. You know, we're a God-fearing nation. nation. And I would say this, that if we do what God wants us to do, and particularly as a man, he will eventually bless you with a wonderful wife. And I'm, I'm going to say this about my wife, Mita Hall, who is, who is herself a doctor. She's a, actually a doctor of nursing practice, who herself comes from a very humble background. I think that because I did the right Stuff, God has blessed me with her. And so I, I thank you very much, George, for having me on your show. Give your best to your wife, to your family, to your friends, <laughs> to everyone around you. Thank you, Dr. Hall. And listen, we'll stay in touch. Uh, we, we've been talking for the last couple of weeks back and forth. We'll continue to stay That's in right. touch. And until then, God bless you, my brother. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you, George. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. 
What a tremendous story. And my time just flies right on by. Uh, and he just, we hit the highlights, the highlights, the highlights, the highlights. Uh, and I'll be back right after this. <laughs> Dr. Hall to come back. That that man that, that man needs help, I'm telling you. My goodness gracious. Uh, his his name is Peter, the man the man who has that affliction there. Uh Peter, you should have been here earlier when Dr. Hall was in the house. He might have been able to uh do something for you, prescribe something to you. Uh but I, I don't know. You've got it bad, man. You need to see somebody, uh, and I don't know what else to tell you. Most of my life was sun beating down on the slippery and stripe. I had a lot of women put me to the blade. That one there, my wife, I made. Well, she drove me to be a crazy man. I took that woman no one else could stand and sent me back to what I was one. Say 
Mississippi River. Mississippi River well, By bold regard I was given a name Crawfish, Kowal, yeah, one and the same They gave us Luke and Abraham The devil sent that woman here to this man To the end of time and thirst And don't take me to either land Just put me underneath that barren sand Oh, there me there on the banks of the Mississippi River Give a great big shout out to Miss Tracy 
out in the Denver area. Uh, thank you, Miss Tracy, for your support, for your help. Uh, I mean, things are clicking around here, folks. I mean, they are clicking. They are clicking so fast that it's hard for me to keep up with it. But we've got some great, great shows. There are some great, listen to me, and we, we throw that word great around quite a bit nowadays, but there are some great, super-duper, whooper-whopper uh, musicians that's coming on the show, and, and we're, we're going to run... <laughs> We're going to run them one right after the other. Uh, and you talk about tapping your feet, snapping your finger, bobbing your head, and shaking your booty. I mean, once that thing starts, you're not going to be able to shut it down. Uh, you're just, you're just going to be doing it all the time. Tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. I want to thank, once again, Dr. Hall for being with us tonight from the Worst Housing Project to a life of accomplishment go to amazon get his book ward of the court and read about it see the contrast all the things that he went through and where he's at today tremendous tremendous man and he's not only a medical doctor ministering to people's physical needs but i believe he's ministering to people in their spiritual needs also so go to amazon and get his book Ward of the Court by Christopher Hall. Whew. Time just flies anymore. Well, we could stay on longer if we wanted. <laughs> but man, oh man. Big shout out to everybody. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your emails, uh, your PMs, uh, your telephone calls. I mean, every time I turn around, I'm getting one, some, or all of them. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words, for your support. Uh, we're moving. We're moving. I'm hanging on. I'm, hang I'm hanging on. This train is moving, so I just get a grip of something, and I'll hang on and ride with it. But listen, everybody, thank you for tuning in to the George Espin Love Show. And don't forget, it's sponsored by Unicorn Chasing with Maxine and Walter. Unicorn Chasing, C H A S I N. Unicorn Chasing with Maxine and Walter. Look them up on Facebook. They have ring bomb parties, live ring bomb parties. Go look them up. Unicorn Chasing with Maxine and Walter. Find out what a ring bomb party is. They'll be delighted that you came. You'll be glad that you did the same. So. What's today? Today's Monday. My goodness, I'm losing track of days. Until Wednesday night, I believe we're going to have Rick Fowler on. Remember last Wednesday, uh, uh, the system went down. It was like Rick and I was walking along talking, and we both fell into a man manhole. Uh, and we had to pull the whole program down. Well, I believe we're going to have him back on Wednesday night. So... That'll set your feet a tap and your fingers snapping, your head bobbing, and your booty shaking for sure. So until Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on Spreaker.com, and you can find us just about every place else out there. But until then, thank you for joining us. Bring a friend next time. If you know someone that didn't hear it tonight, tell them you can go in and listen to it all over again. You can even download it and do with it what you want. Thank you, everybody, for your kind words, for your support. Thank you, Dr. Hall, one more time. God bless you and your lovely wife. God bless all of you that's listening. Down the street, around the corner, across America, and around the world. Until then. This is George Espinoff saying, be kind to one another, love one another, help one another. I pray God will keep you right in the center of his hand. Good night, everybody.